I can get it for a couple seconds, but it's Absolutely. And you can also go, if you have your laptop, you can go to our um, course page. And this is this is the PhD. I'm just going to show this because the EDD is somewhat similar to that. I just want you to be oriented to what is available to you. Important, on the top you have the School of Education Graduate Bulletin. So, you will ha you have an advisor, you all contacted your advisors, but it is really up to you to find out about the program and to read about it. And the best and most detailed source for doing that is the Graduate Bulletin, because that tells you everything. It gives you course descriptions, it tells you about your whole sequence of your studies and what you need to do. Um, as advisors, we're not going to be sending you reminders about things. As advisors, we will help you work out your program, um, be a sounding board. Uh, a lot of times I get questions like, well, what should I register for next semester? And it's a hard question for me to answer because I'm not taking your program. We want you to take courses that you are interested in that kind of excite you. And I think it's a little easier once you're here, you know, for a semester or so, because then you start talking to other students and they tell you and they make recommendations. It's just a little bit more difficult your first semester trying to decide what to take. Um, let me, let me uh, show you the program of study form. So all of you uh, will be filling this out at some point, and usually you want to get this done by the end of your first semester. Isn't that correct, James? End of your first semester, you want to have that. In the first up. year, if you're a PhD first student. year, first semester, first yeah. year, um, and this kind of keeps track of what you're doing and making sure that you're on track and that you're getting the required number of credits. There's a little summary over there. How many courses, how many hours are required for each major category of your program of studies? And I'm, I'm just going to go over that a little bit more carefully. You notice the first thing up here is advisory committee. Okay, so think of your program as sort of two parts. You have your advisor, then you need to get an advisory committee, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. You, may, you do your exams with this advisory committee, and then you form your dissertation committee, and you work on your dissertation. It can be the same people, it can be people who are totally different. Because sometimes it takes a while for you as a student to identify your interests and to identify professors with whom you want to work, you know, who share your interests. So sometimes it takes a little while for you to figure those things out. So initially you're assigned an advisor. Um, you are able to change your advisor um, if you find somebody that is a little bit more in, within your interests, because that person is going to work with you on your exams, on your qualifying exams. So you start out with your advisor, and that's the chair of your advisory committee. Okay, And then you have to t pick two other people. Someone in the department, <coughs> and someone who is in your minor. And those people will be the ones who accompany you through your exams. Okay. So that's the first, and, and you have, you know, until you fill this program of study forms, you have that time to fill that section out as well. And some people take, some people take a while, but it, it's good if you can do that in the first year. Okay, so here are the major courses. So major courses meaning LCLE, whatever your focus is, whether it be it literacy, language education, these are the required courses that you need to take. So L600 
is the course that we recommend that first semester doctoral students take, also the online students. There's a section for the EDD online program that's separate from the on-campus section. And you can see that when you register. So don't register <coughs> for the online EDD program unless you're in that program, and vice versa. Then there's L601, which is offered in the spring. So typically, you take L600 in the fall, and you take L601 in the spring. So, Simone, you might have taken L601 already. Is that correct? No. You haven't. Okay. So then you would take L600 in the fall and L601 in the spring. L650 comes a little bit later, maybe in your second year. Um, that can be done, well, that, let's say that course is a little bit in flux for those people who are on campus. For the EDD online students, that's a set sequence that you'll see. Um, L650 can be done with uh, faculty on an individual basis. If there's a special, I think it's like an apprenticeship course, an apprenticeship in research, in um, teaching, or in another professional area. For example, I'll give you a student working with me this semester. I'm an editor of the Journal of Children's Literature, and I have a student who is my editorial assistant this semester. So that's a really great way of, of seeing what's going on in the field, and she's very interested in that. Then you have the L750 courses, um, and you need to take two of those. We recommend that you take those a little bit further along in your program, because they tend to be at a more theoretical level. Um, but keep your eyes open to see what is being offered because the topic changes every semester. And we usually go language education fall, um, literacy spring, and then sometimes there's a course offered in the summertime. Keep your eyes peeled. If there's something that you like, you can take it a little bit earlier on. You know, if it's a topic that is, that's what I want to learn about, take it. You know, so really, really check those very, very carefully. Then you have two other ones. Uh, L599 is called Early Inquiry Experience. Have some of you, do some of you have a master's degree where you did a master's thesis? Master's thesis? No? Okay. A master's thesis would substitute for that. All right. If you don't have a master's thesis, then you need to take um, 599. And sometimes our doctoral students come directly from an undergraduate program, and they do both their master's and their doctoral work here. Does that apply to anyone in the room? From here, okay. And you're, you're going to be doing the whole program. Yes, okay, well we do have that as well. So your advisor will talk to you about whether you want to get a master's degree, along the way, or whether you would just want to go for the full out EDD, PhD, PhD, okay. And then we have L700, which is a more advanced research course that should be taken very, very late in your program. Okay, so what about all these other things? You need 36 credits, all right? That's a lot of credits here, 12 courses. What do you fill those in with? Well, we have a lot of courses that are offered in the department. So you get to choose whatever you want. And sometimes that's hard because you have a lot of choice in this program. You can choose lots of different things that you're interested in. So again, keep your eye on what's being offered in the upcoming semester and what your interests are. Do you have any questions about that part? Any questions? Um, yeah. One of one of our online EDD students has a question about L599. So yes. If they have written their master's thesis, then it would be counted as 599 or? Um, I think it would be. You should ask your advisor about that. 
Mm. It has to be a thesis, though. I did a portfolio, and I still had to do the. It has to be an actual thesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where you get your little book mm -hmm. that's finished at the end. Yes. Just you know, for the seven fifties, that if you submit your program of studies at the end of the first year, you might have they might ask a few questions about the topics of your seven fifties, and because those aren't known very far in advance, you won't be able to say for sure what those topics are. But if you're a language person, you're likely to take them in the fall. If you're a literature person, you're likely to take them in the spring. So just putting that on there and submitting it is better than waiting until you know exactly what they are. So yeah, just, that's a good point. Yeah, just so. And <laughs> also, we're saying you have to submit those in the first year. Does that mean that it's set in stone? Does that mean that every course you've written down you must take, and the answer is no. There's called a revision. So when you change your mind, which you may very well do, then you just submit a revision. And it's very simple. They're going to send this thing back to you three times. Anyway. Yeah. Three times, it's, right? Yeah. I'm on my fifth, I think. Fifth revision. <laughs> and I've submitted four amendments. So it's just get it in so that you get past that part. Just get it I in. Didn't do that, huh? yeah. it's, I think you know we want to make sure that you have an idea of where you're headed, or you have an idea of all the courses you need to take, and how that somehow fits together. So get it in, and then you can revise. So it doesn't mean that that it's set in stone. Sometimes courses aren't offered when you think they will be, or sometimes new courses are offered that you didn't know about. We also have. Um, the L750, so those are topics that change. We have an L630 that has topics that change every semester. So check those out too, the L630s every semester, because there might be a great topic that you're interested in. Yeah. Um, um, this is just a heads up. Um, one of the reasons that the LCLE GSO is important, and you should go to the brown bag lunches and any meetings that we have, is because you find out tips and tricks. like. Which professor's class is so popular that it gets filled up almost immediately, and therefore you have to, the day it opens to register in, in the class, you have to go sign up if you want that class. Because it, you may not be able to get it for like another two years. So it's, it's important to talk to other graduate students who come before you and to attend to which classes you might need and then get on as soon as um, registration opens up. Like, there's, there's some classes with some professors that if you don't sign up that day, you're, you're waiting for a year or two if you really want it, so. Yeah, that tends to happen also for the inquiry courses mm -hmm. that aren't yeah. offered. It, it isn't necessarily that those are the most popular courses, but it could be that the topics aren't offered that often, yes. I'm sorry, but um, could you just speak a little bit louder? <laughs> For the Me? online, yeah, and all students, current students, when you talk, please talk a little bit slower and please speak more louder, <laughs> then they can hear you more clearly. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, they can hear. They say now they I can, don't want yeah. to say anything. <laughs> well, Dr. Okay. Adam, you, you, they can okay. hear you well if it first all right. students. So when you're making comments, please make sure that you're speaking louder and more slowly. Okay, um, all right, so this is the major component. And then you have the inquiry courses. So as a PhD EDD student, uh, EDD students, uh, I, this is the PhD form, but the EDD have three. Yeah, it just tells you how many you need. Um, Usually it's Y520 or Y521, but not both. And Y520 is recommended for master's students, and Y521 for PhD is, students. Yes. You do not need a quantitative course. People still are under the impression that they need to take a quantitative research course. If you are interested in quantitative research, you can take all the courses quantitative research. But if you're interested in qualitative research, which is a strength in our department, you do not need to take a quantitative course. Because I still have students asking me, 
oh, I still have to fit in my statistics course. No, you don't need to take your statistics course. Isn't that good news? Yes. <laughs> For those of you who don't love statistics, it's great news. The advantage, however, if you do take a quantitative research course, you will be able to understand the research that people are doing. So it does have an advantage, okay? But you don't have to do that, and people are still telling you. So if your advisor tells you you have to take a quantitative course, tell them that Dr. Automat said you do not have to. <laughs> and then they can check with James D'Amico, too, and get that. Um, okay, let's go on to minor. I have a question. Yes. Um, could you give us, give us some examples of the inquiry courses? Like what numbers, besides like 520, 521? Usually Y, they're Y courses. Okay, so so if you go, have, do you know where the courses are listed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? You go to the registrar site, and it's called Course Browser, and then you look at the student version, and then you can look under the WISE courses that are being offered that particular semester. Your advisor should also have a more comprehensive list of when courses are being offered, and either your advisor or you can check with the inquiry department. See, we have an inquiry department. We have a whole department for inquiry courses. They can check to see what courses would be um, better tailored to your needs. Yes? As I'm an inquiry minor. Um, if you're taking qualitative classes, there's really four uh, professors that I think you need to look out for. Uh, the Karsh Beckins. Uh, Jessica Lester and Barbara Dennis are the ones that teach most of the qualitative courses. I would also suggest um, that you don't just take all introductory courses. Right. Please try to get up into more advanced courses. So take an introductory course and then try to get into more advanced courses. Because what the more advanced inquiry courses do is you actually do data analysis. Because a lot of times we get students who are ready to do their studies for their dissertations and they haven't really analyzed data before. <clears throat> and it's hard to learn it while you're gathering your data. And it's also hard to teach people on an individual basis as a dissertation chair. Yeah. Um, so with the inquiry courses, you have to start with either Y520 or 521, and then most of the advanced courses that um, Dr. Adama is talking about are, um, you also have to take Y611 or the Y612, 613 sequence, which are the sort of foundational qualitative courses, and then you'll have room if you're not minoring for one or two upper level courses. So um, that's something to think about. You have to get those out of the way unless you go to the faculty, the faculty member teaching the course and explain why you can take X course without having taken the prerequisite. So. And of course, the online EDD students are looking for those inquiry courses that are offered online that will fit into their program. And there's quite a number of those. So if you're not sure, talk to your advisor again. Um, I have always contacted the people in inquiry for individual students to try to work out a program that would fit their interests. Right? So there's a lot of choices and there are a lot of online courses offered as well. So we have a lot of choices. Let's get let's get on to the um, to the minor. So this is going to be different for the PhD students who have a minor and possibly a second minor. So as a PhD student, you could have two minors if you want, or you could have one minor and then a whole bunch of other courses that you're interested in. Usually, um, people take, well, okay. You can minor in anything as long as there's a justification for what you want to do. I've had students in East Asian studies, German, um, all English, all sorts of different minors outside of the School of Education. I would say most of our students have a minor within the School of Education, so a very popular minor would be Curriculum Studies, for example, or one of the other departments in the School of Education. 
but it doesn't have to be that. It depends on what you want to do. So I heard people saying they, they're interested in early childhood. So they could go over to the curriculum and instruction department and find early childhood courses that match their interests. All right. So it's really, I mean, I guess the hardest thing in general is you have to figure out what you want to do. And that's the hardest thing of all. You know, you have to figure it out. So I'm not going to tell you as an advisor, oh, you know, that's a good professor. Take that course. I don't do that. I ask you, well, what do you really want to do? What are you interested in? So you always need to be asking yourself those questions. What's my purpose? What am I interested in? What do I want to take? And you need to be looking. Look at the sites. Look at the registrar's site, especially for the online people. What courses are offered online? What courses are offered on site? The people who are here on campus, they can. you can also take online courses, too, if you want. It's no problem. Okay, so you have could a minor. I, could then. I add one more thing about minor? Yes. Um, from my experience, it took a year to choose my doctor minor. And I found um, IU is the only school I found and see from my student, um, my um, friends in other universities who has doctor minor. And it's a very unique and very um, excellent idea of having a doctor minor. And I chose counseling psychology as my doctor minor, and I didn't expect that those psychological aspects will be the main idea for my dissertation. But actually, it became the frame one of the main frameworks for my dissertation. So it really helped me to change my mindset, and it really helped me to refine those frameworks for my dissertation topic. Yeah, it's great that you have a chance to bring mm -hmm. those diverse perspectives into your research. Yes. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So it encourages interdisciplinary work and research. And um, yeah, okay. So you have another category. It can either be um, a second minor or just some courses that you want to take. Okay. Because some people are more, you know, eclectic. They like to do a little of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And other people are very focused and they want to really go into depth into something. So then your then your dissertation. So after you take your qualifying exams, you register for dissertation proposal preparation, and then you have your um, doctoral thesis credits, okay? And that's going to vary depending on whether you're a PhD student or an EDD student, okay? But the EDD program of study form gives you the exact number. I just didn't want to go through both because we don't have enough time for that. In addition, I just wanted to mention this. We have two areas of concentration that you can do uh, if you're not sure of what you want to take. We have a uh, EFL, ESL concentration that you could take too. And there's uh, some beautiful brochures here that Gian had worked so hard on. And then uh, we, which has the acronym EDP, which sounds terrible. <laughs> then the other one, which also sounds kind of like a mouthful, is Kyle. It's the Children's and Young Adult uh, Literature Graduate Certificate Program. And this is open to both um, master's and doctoral students. And then there's a number of courses that you can take uh, to concentrate in that. And I'm the one who coordinates this program. So if you're interested, just send me an email. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. I do have, uh, I do have a course that I'm offering uh, this fall. But unfortunately, the course is completely full. So, with a waiting list. So, um, you'll have to wait a couple of years <laughs> to take that one. I'm sorry. But, yeah. But I can tell you about the program. There are other courses that you're able to take, too. Okay? So, do you have any questions about that in particular? Um, actually, we have one question about qualifying exams. So, what it okay. is qualifying exam sure. from one of our United students? So, could you? What is the qualifying yeah. exam? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, 
it, it is what it says it is. It <laughs> means that you're qualified to write your dissertation. So what it is, uh, it is arranged with your advisor, getting back to the advisory committee, the chair of your advisory committee in conjunction with the other committee members will help you develop questions that you are supposed to answer. There's different forms that it takes, so you arrange that with your advisor. Most commonly, it's a set of questions that you work on for a month, and then you turn them in and you defend your answers. And when everything is satisfactory, you get that stamp, and lo and behold, you can go on to um, write your proposal, your dissertation proposal. Should I answer what the dissertation proposal is too? Yes. I'll answer that. So the dissertation proposal is something that you write. It's, a li it's between, let's say, 40 and 60 pages. It's a blueprint for how you're going to do your dissertation research. It's very helpful. It's a very helpful thing for you to think clearly about that. Because once you go and you start gathering data, boy, that time goes by so fast. So if you have a really clear blueprint of what you want to do, then that helps you very, very much. So you think about your framework, you think about how you're going to, add, how you're going to collect the data, your setting, and so on and so forth. And some of that can translate directly into your dissertation that can form the basis of some of the chapters in your dissertation already. So that's a very important thing. Okay, so after you do your dissertation proposal, then you have to go and get your permissions and permissions from the schools or whatever you're going to do, and that's when you can start gathering your data. And that varies <coughs> wildly, the, the amount of time you spend doing that. Um, that's all I'll say, depending on what your site is. Some people can only, for example, gather data during a summer program. Some people gather data for a whole semester in a school. Um, that's something you're going to work out with your dissertation chair. All right. Now, did we have some more biographies that, uh, Gion, that we should share? Yeah, we have two we, more. Why don't we hear who else is sure. listening? Um, so... So, I oh, so Jessica Thomas is here, and she is living in Greenwood, Indiana, and she has taught elementary education for about 15 years, but currently at home with three children, and taught at the University of Tampa, and would like to continue teaching literacy in the education department for a local college. And also, we have Lisa Wigwersig, and um, Currently, she lives in Chile, and and she's interested in multiple literacies as they relate to minority language groups within onlingual systems and approaches to plurilingualism. And current, currently, she's training adult learners to help them succeed in higher education. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a really lovely, just imagine the, just all the different threads of people's experiences and their interests in classes. I mean, for me, it's so interesting teaching classes with all of you because of the perspectives that you all bring and the experience that you bring to it. So the, I think the courses are very rich, rich in discussion, rich in ideas. Um, yeah, uh, why don't we open it up for questions because we really only have about five more minutes. Were there any questions that you had about your program? You have all contacted your advisors, so that's good. Um, anything else that you wanted to know about? Yes? Um, could you explain the residency section on the back page? That means? Yeah. Um, James, help me out. What, what do we require? Three semesters or two? Two. Two semesters where you're full time? Mm -hmm. They have to be um, back to back back-to-back -back semesters like where you're a full-time student. Okay. And what's considered full-time? Is that 12 hours? No, it's nine, nine, nine credits. Don't take one hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's... Don't do it. Don't do it. 
don't take 12 hours. <laughs> unless you're, unless you found a way that every single project where all of them are coming from the same. Quadruple <laughs> day. Yeah, which is something you shouldn't do either. <laughs> because we can usually tell if you're writing it for another course or if you've written it for another course. Because suddenly it doesn't sound like what we've been doing in our course except for maybe a couple pages. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, we've seen it all. We've seen it all. Okay, any other questions that you might have? With inquiry courses, it's possible though, because you're doing different frames on analysis. So, like, go to narrative analysis, and discourse analysis, and whatever. Like, then you can do it. But, like, it's just to, like, see, these are the things that we will not say officially at meetings, but I'm sure that you will <laughs> tell <laughs> each other behind the scenes that. once oh. you're here. Okay. I don't even know. Well, that's not, like, that's not self plagiarism if you're just using the same data or yeah. writing it up and analyzing it in different places. Some, some professors are okay with you double dipping, but you should ask them. Okay. I just have a question about residency. If you're also teaching at the same time, is that considered full time? Would you still have to take nine and teach two classes? Full -time. The answer is yes, isn't you it? Are. That's nice. I'm looking I think to so. James. You're not required to teach them. Okay. Because you're, te you're teaching, some of our students have fellowships and they're teaching undergraduate courses while they're taking courses as well, which is quite a challenge. Yeah. So the residency would also apply to them, wouldn't it? I mean, it's yeah, just I have to double credits. check that, Jill. Okay. Actually. Yeah, I let's check that it one. was full time if you taught two and mm -hmm. took two. I, I must I be. can speak to that one. for sure. Okay. It, it's, if you don't take three, like nine credits, it doesn't matter what else you're doing. Because I thought that in my second semester, I was taking six credits and teaching two classes, and it did not count towards my residency. So. Wow. So okay. So if that's the case, we have to look up, look that up for you because mm -hmm. that doesn't come up that often. Mm -hmm. um, you got that? Yeah, I also want to say one more thing. Uh, when you're thinking of the courses and papers, Adam's uh, discussion of papers brought this up in my mind. If you have a topic in mind, do try to find uh, ways of bringing that topic into the courses that you're taking as you go through so that you can explore it in a preliminary way because you'll get to know what research literature is available, what some of the issues are in that field. Um, you can also take, uh, we didn't talk about this, but you can also take independent studies with various professors. For example, if you have a, you know, let's say you want to do um, a literature review and you want to see what's out there, that might be a good topic for an independent study. And an independent study is L690. And sometimes some of us uh, have, Sometimes some of us have, uh, this is just for on campus, not for the online people, but sometimes some of us have research groups. Um, you know, I do that once in a while. I'm doing that this semester, but that's, again, that's not a, an open course. That's something that you arrange with a particular professor to work with that person. I wanted to speak to the independent study. When you have an idea of what you want, what subject you want to tackle in your dissertation, it's good to do one of those independent studies because you get to choose your own list of readings. So you basically are just data mining and hoarding for what your dissertation is going to be as long as you get a professor who can sign off on it and add some guidance. Uh, and then you basically can create a literature review which will basically be your, uh, not your data set, but your theory set that you come back to for all of your dissertation. So I've taken like two uh, independent studies. I think it's really good for preparing you for the dissertation. Can you explain one of them, Adam? Um, so I knew that I wanted to do work on spoken word pedagogy in classrooms with poetry and with performance. So I uh, got um, worked with Carmen Medina, who is into performance studies here, and she's my advisor. So it was a really good fit. So I basically just, for one semester, read as much about poetry, slam, and hip hop as I possibly could. Um, I got to choose all of my own readings, and I like combined it with uh, pop culture readings, with strong theory, with you know different types of things that would really be beneficial. And then I made a basically a working bibliography for myself 
So uh, <clears throat> ending that semester, I didn't know anything about the dissertation process, but I had 26 different sources that I knew that I could use for my dissertation. So when I go back to my, when I start my dissertation, this work, it's my fourth year, um, I can go back to those readings that I did for um, that class, and I have all of the information I need from that bibliography. And just having, Thanks, Adam. Just having done that too, sometimes you take a class, and then you realize what you want to do some research on. And I've had uh, research groups where students work more intensively on their paper that they developed, and um, we've had quite a good number of students who publish papers, like Adam, from uh, one of the courses that I've given. So sometimes he didn't he didn't work on that in a research group, but I've had other students who have worked on that afterwards in a in an independent study, or they've explored yeah. a topic. Well, I was going to say I explored a topic. Uh, it was lovely. And if you're thinking about doing that, reach out to a professor that's working in the area you're interested in well in advance and try to treat it like you're creating a course for yourself. So you, the bulk of the work is on you. So if you go to them with an idea, you can go and meet and discuss it, but like you are guiding it and it's a professional relationship. So being prepared and um, setting goals and all of that is, is like the onus is on you. It's independent, not they're not going to tell you what to do. They'll help you, but that, like that's not their job, and they don't have time for it, too, because well, it's not like you know, like it's, you it's get extra feedback. work. <laughs> you get feedback, but yeah. you know, it's something that you're going to be doing when you're in the f when after you graduate. That's what you're going to be doing if you're in the academia, if that's your goal, or not, or whatever your goal happens to be. Okay, we are actually over. James, isn't that true? We're starting at um, 2 with the next session. Yes, I think it's break time, yeah, right, Amanda? Yeah, we have a little bit of a break right now, so if everybody would like to take some time, and we'll meet back in the room we were just in at 2 o'clock, and we'll get to hear from some current grad students, so I think it will extend this discussion that's happening right now. So Thank you, you everyone. Nice to Thank have you. met you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, for all of you who do not have your student IDs, because I know that several of you yeah. had questions about that.